Diabetes Connections is brought to you by the One Touch brand, providing diabetes management solutions for people living with diabetes, including the One Touch Vario Flex blood glucose meter and the One Touch Reveal mobile app. Taking a step forward starts with seeing where you are. And by Dexcom, take control of your diabetes with the world's first continuous glucose monitoring system that sends glucose readings directly to your compatible smart device. Live life on your own terms with Dexcom. Hi, it's Stacy. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacy Sims. This week, he's cracked the code on how to wait less and do more at Disney World. So how can Lentesta use those numbers to help people with diabetes? And we're talking some pretty big numbers. So the number of possible ways you can visit the rides grows more than exponentially. If you want to see 10 rides, there's 3.628 million different ways you could <laughs> you can you can see those 10 rides. Uh, by the time you get to like 20 or 20 run, 21 rides, there are uh, 51 million billion different combinations. Um, so that's why you need computers. We'll find out about a new system called Glucose Path from Len and the endocrinologist who pulled him into the project. And we get some good Disney advice from him as well. Plus, this week marks 11 years of type 1 for my son and my family. And a new connection to tell you about, we are partnering with No Foods. It all starts now on Diabetes Connections. Welcome to another week of Diabetes Connection. So glad you could join us. I am sorry about my voice. I'm nursing a cold. Just about everybody in my house has this yuck, cough and cold thing that's going around. But I'm really excited to bring you this interview with Len Testa because it's fascinating to see how the math and the algorithms that he has used so successfully with Disney World. I mean, this is the touring plans and the unofficial guide to Disney World. Those are all Len Testa's books, websites, and I'll link everything up in the show notes, but how he's used the way to wait less and do more at Disney World to find the best medications for people with diabetes. Now, I just want to let you know up front, the focus here with Glucose Path is on type 2. This is not something that is available for people with type 1, but we talk about that. And I do think this kind of stuff is fascinating because the diabetes community as a whole can benefit. But just to be clear, this is about type 2. But it's fascinating stuff, and they, they take a lot of things into consideration, including affordability. So we will get to that in just a little while. And I am a huge Disney planner. We don't go all the time. We go maybe every couple of years. But whenever we go, I have found it is so worth it to plan. And so I'm a little bit of a fangirl when it comes to Len Testa and his stuff. I highly recommend the touringplans.com website. And hey, if you are new to the show, we aim to educate and inspire about time type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connections. We talk to athletes and celebrities and uh, bloggers, authors, as well as people just living day to day with type 1. My son was diagnosed, as I said, 11 years ago. He was not yet 2 and he is just about to be 13. My husband has type 2 diabetes. I don't have diabetes, but I have a background in broadcasting, radio and television, and that's how you get the podcast. Something else that's going on this week, I'm so excited to kick this off. As I mentioned in the tease at the beginning of the show there, we are partnering with No Foods, that is K-N-O-W, and we spoke to them a couple of weeks ago. They came to my attention after making a big donation. They bought all the bikes for the riders on the Bike Beyond Tour, Coast to Coast this summer, and I wanted to find out more about them. So I had the founder of the company on, and after that interview, we got to talking, and it seemed like a really natural partnership. They sent us a giant box of food. I talked about that. We are still working on the video review of that. But you're talking about food that is grain, gluten, wheat, soy, dairy, peanut, yeast, and as they say, guilt-free. And it's all made with flax and chia, coconuts, almonds, egg whites. It's really incredible stuff. So I thought that this would be a terrific partnership for the podcast. And also personally, because as I said, my husband has type 2. I I really thought this would be great for him. Benny um, really enjoys anything with chocolate chips in it, like the donuts and the muffins and the waffles. But I, I thought it would be good for him once in a while. But I really thought it was my husband. Well, come to find out, it's actually... Terrific for me. 
And that's because just after we came to this agreement with No Foods, I kid you not, and the people at No Foods don't even know about this yet. I went to see my doctor and I have, um, I have a health condition myself. I have ulcerative colitis and I have had that very well controlled. It's, um, really doesn't flare up, but I've been having some issues, but this is not the UC podcast. That's another thing for another time. And you don't need to know too much about my stomach. But my doctor said, why don't you try going gluten free for a month and see how you feel? And my heart sank because Look, I've talked to a lot of people in our community who have celiac, who have gluten sensitivity, and it is not an easy life. And I am a lazy cook, right? I mean, I am, I don't enjoy cooking. That's my husband's thing. I don't bake. Um, you know, I do my best to give my kids healthy meals, but I'm thinking to myself, what a pain. And then I remembered I have a fridge full of gluten free, no foods at home. So I have since reordered, I'll tell you my favorite items right off the bat. I'm not doing commercials for them yet, but I guess this is one anyway. I love the donuts and the muffins. The buns are terrific. Benny likes the chocolate chip waffles. But you know, no, nothing that's gluten free tastes like the quote real thing. But here's how it works for me. I, I'm in the habit every day around three o'clock, 2.30 ish, Before the kids come home from school, I have a cup of coffee and I have something with it. It's usually like a bar, you know, a a cliff bar, a Luna bar, something like that. And to be able to have a gluten-free alternative has made it much easier to transition to this lifestyle. It was just that afternoon snack. And it sounds so silly, but if you've ever had to do this, you know what I'm talking about, right? If you have to give up something like dairy or gluten or soy, it's that one thing you're like, oh, can't they find something to substitute? So I've been thrilled. You will be hearing much more about No Foods in the next year. Gosh, that's only a couple of weeks away. But right now, we're doing a giveaway. And I will tell you how we are doing that giveaway. It's very easy to enter. In fact, we're going to be doing a giveaway every week in 2018 from No Foods. But hang on one second. I'll tell you about this one. Just one moment. Let me tell you about one of our other sponsors, One Touch. One Touch has been a trusted brand in blood glucose management for more than 30 years. This year, U.S. News and World Report named One Touch the number one pharmacist recommended in blood glucose monitoring devices and lancets based on a survey of pharmacists nationwide. Find out more about the One Touch brand products at diabetes connections.com and click on the One Touch logo. Okay, so how do you win $50 from No Foods? Very easy. Go to the Facebook page. Go to Diabetes Connections Facebook page. You will see the contest. Just comment on that post as directed, and we will pick a winner in one week's time. The closing date of the contest will be right there on the post, and the winner, chosen at random, will receive $50 at No Foods. I am so excited to partner with them. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hey, stay tuned after the interview with Len Testa, all about Disney and diabetes. I am going to be talking about 11 years with type 1 with Benny and and sharing a story, you know, it's, he's 13 years old later this month. He's a big dude now. He's playing football. But I want to share a story about Elmo from when he was very little and how Elmo helped with diabetes. So stay tuned after that. And I also want to mention, uh, when I say Disney and diabetes, we did a show a while back about going to Disney with type 1. And I'll link that up because I know this time of year, a lot of people are going on vacation. There's a lot of tricks and tips that were offered. This was a travel agent whose son and husband have type 1, so she knows what she is talking about. And I'll link that up in the show notes and at diabetes-connections.com. Okay, one of the best things about the Dexcom system, one of our other great sponsors, is being able to send more information and communicate more clearly with our endocrinologist. The Dexcom G5 mobile CGM system gives you a reading every five minutes so that you can spot trends and get a dynamic picture of your blood glucose levels. Look, at this point, and Benny is a teenager, we're adjusting a lot being able to send our information through Dexcom Clarity to our endo makes appointments a lot more productive. Our doctor has more information related to Benny's glucose levels. Managing diabetes is not easy, but I feel like we have one of the very best CGM systems working for us. CGM-based treatment requires finger sticks for calibration, may result in hypoglycemia if calibration not performed or symptoms expectations do not match CGM readings. For more information, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. My guest this week has one of those minds that seems to see in math. You know, you and I stand in line at Disney and think, 
This stinks. Is Space Mountain really worth it? Well, Len Testa stood in line and thought, this could be so much easier, and I'm going to use my master's thesis to figure it out. He has a very successful website called touringplans.com, which will help you figure your day to the minute if you want to do it that way at Disney World or even at Universal. It's got so many terrific features. We have used it for years. I will not go to Disney World without it. And I don't plan everything to the to the second, I swear, but it's so helpful. And now Len is using some similar math to help people with diabetes. Glucose Path is an app he's developed with endocrinologist Dr. Bradley Eilerman. Now, it's for people with type 2, but I think it may have applications down the road for people with type 1 and other kinds of diabetes. And as a certified Disney nerd, I am not passing up the chance to talk to Len Testa. Len and Brad, thanks so much for joining me. This is going to be fun and interesting. Thanks for making the time. Thanks for the opportunity. Brad, We're going to be talking a lot, obviously, about diabetes and the power here of information. But, Brad, are you okay sitting tight for a second? Because I want to talk Disney first. No problem. Okay, so stand by. (laughs) Len, talk to us a little bit, if you could, about how you got started in this intense math planning, crunching the numbers as you do on, on touring plans. How does something like that happen? Uh, it started when I visited uh, Disney World the summer before I started graduate school. So I was going to graduate school for computer science. Uh, and before the fall semester began, I took a trip to Disney World with my twin sister. It's, uh, Disney World is one of the things that we uh, we love together. And I remember waiting for two hours in line for a great movie ride and thinking to myself, man, there's got to be a better way to see Disney World and avoid these lines. So I went back to my thesis advisor's. And I said, I think this is an interesting problem. How do I avoid lines in Walt Disney World? And they said, uh, they had two questions for me. Uh, one, uh, is the problem complicated enough that it's worthy of a thesis? Mm. And then two, does anyone, anyone else besides you really care about this? So it turns out that trying to minimize your weight in line at Disney World is one of the fundamental problems in math and computer science. It's this thing called the traveling salesman problem. Uh, and it comes up in places like package delivery, like FedEx or UPS or the post office. So if you think of yourself as the delivery person, if you think of the wait in line at Disney World as the traffic between customers, and if you think of the rides as customers, uh, it's exactly the same problem that, that UPS faces every day. So my master's thesis actually expanded on the PhD dissertation of UPS's lead research scientist in terms of how to do this all efficiently. Yeah. That's really interesting because I wouldn't think of, of Disney World and we, you know, waiting in line as something that your FedEx guy is using too, but it really is the same kind of information. And it's, it's actually a huge uh, problem uh, in terms of scale. So I'll give you an example. If you want to ride five rides in Walt Disney World, um, you've got five ways to choose the first ride. You've got four ways to choose the next ride, three ways to choose the ride after that, and two rides, and then so on. So the number of possible ways you can visit the rides grows more than exponentially. If you want to see 10 rides, there's 3.628 million different ways you, could, <laughs> you, can, you can see those 10 rides. Uh, by the time you get to like 20 or 20 run, 21 rides, there are uh, 51 million billion different combinations. Um, so that's why you need computers. And even then, some of these problems get so big that even if you took every computer that's ever existed and you ran it for as long as the universe has existed, you would never get an exact answer. So you have to approximate, and uh, making good approximation algorithms is what we do. That's amazing. So, well, it really is. Well, I've used it. Um, you know, as I as I said, I am a big touring plans fan, and um, it really it does make everything. I don't know. I mean, it's it's the it looks like magic from where I sit because I'm not seeing any of the math and the calculations. How, can you share anything about how you've tweaked it over the years? Because Disney World has changed, the math has to have changed. Sure. Um, FastPass and FastPass Plus are the two big changes that we've we've had to the uh, had to make to the algorithms. With original FastPass, remember you had to if um, if you wanted to get a reservation on a ride, you had to walk over to the ride and get a paper reservation, and then go back to whatever you were doing until your reservation time became available. So we had to tweak the algorithm to account for all the extra walking that you had to do. So for example, if you wanted to. If you were on the, the right side of the park and you wanted to get a ride reservation for the left side of the park, we had to account for the fact that you had to walk all the way across the park and then all the way back and, uh, to get the reservation and then do the exact same walking again to actually ride the ride. When FastPass Plus came out, it's an app-based system for reservations, so you didn't have to do the walking. 
And you, you remember, Stacey, at one point, Disney had both systems running at the same time. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> where, where you could walk or you could not walk, you know, and you could use the app, or you could not use the app. And we had to support all of those things at the same time. So that was um, that was really the big difficulty with uh, with things. The other thing that we're, we're trying to handle now are ride breakdowns, which are unexpected and they're unplanned, and then weather. And those are the two things we're working on actively right now. Florida weather, you're trying to figure that out? Yeah, I mean, I, I can just assume that at four o'clock it's going to rain right. every day during the summer, right? <laughs> we could just do that, and that would be, yeah. But sometimes it rains at two o'clock, and that uh, that that changes your plans, yeah. So those are the two things that we're uh, we're actively trying to work on right now. All right, well, I'm going to ask you more about Disney a little bit later on right. because I, I could talk about that all day. But <laughs> let's bring in Dr. Bradley Eilerman to talk more about what's going on here with Glucose Path, and this is um, pretty amazing when you think about it. It's basically an application that figures out, a, you know, a patient with type 2 diabetes, figure out, you know, the class of medication based on uh, historical clinical data, um, other things like health insurance and, and budgeting. But before we get to what it is, Dr. Eilerman, tell me the problem. What, what was the problem that you all are trying to solve here? So if you think about a typical person with type 2 diabetes, um, as you move along, we end up combining uh, medicine as the disease progresses. And we're getting new medicines all the time. It's one of the things I really enjoy about being in the endocrinologic field is that I get more tools in order to help people get to where they want to be. And as we start to accumulate tools, we have to be making good decisions. Does this, those decisions are being affected all the time by new studies, by insurance formularies, by side effects that patients will experience, and it can become overwhelming. So at a visit, Typically, an endocrinologist has a system or a pattern in which we're prescribing things, but what we like to think that we do a little bit better than a generalist is the fact that we can adapt to patients given individual aspects, I think, a little bit better. When you look at the scope of the problem, though, the human mind is going to be limited by the same kind of problem that Len talks about with regard to to touring Disney World. And so that's where I, I thought that we could do better if we had a machine helping us make the decision. Okay. Before we explain further, what made you think as an endocrinologist, you know, hmm, we really could use Disney planning here. I mean, did you just think about the math that you obviously knew had to be behind it? Did you know, Len, were you a touring plans guy? I mean, how was that connection made? So um, I started listening to Len's podcast when I was a, a fellow in endocrinology. Ah. I've, I've been a Disney fan all my life. And, you know, you gather pretty quickly that Len's a, a very smart guy um, through, uh, through listening to the podcast, and he solves a lot of problems through that. A couple of podcasts that he did really stuck in my head. They did a Disney version of Would You Rather, where they would – give a, a budget, and then Len would take the other people um, on the show, and he'd talk about the trade-offs. So would you rather stay in a deluxe resort and eat counter service or stay in a, a value resort and eat at um, premier restaurants? And I thought, well, these are the kind of decisions I'm making with regard to my patients. Do you want to pay a little bit more um, and get a medicine that generates weight loss, or are you going for a less expensive regimen and have the risk of hypoglycemia, et cetera? And then what, what really was the final trigger is I was, I was looking up Len on the internet and I saw an article that was written about him in the magazine Wired. And he was describing his approach and he said that he was really trying to look at the Disney problem in terms of the guests, rather in terms of, in terms of the theme park. And I thought what I was looking for with regard to diabetes is I wanted someone to be looking this at this in terms of what the patient needs and the patient wants rather than trying to describe human physiology on the whole. So I, I sent him an email and uh, here we are. Okay, so you you found each other. And then let's talk about really where you go from there because the problem seems to be you know, so individualized. Len, when you looked at this, what did you first think? Could you just think, yeah, we can do that? So the first thing I tried to figure out was whether it was possible. And Brent had really thought this thing through. And one of the things he had, he had pointed out was that there were, at the time, I think we were looking at like like 60 different medicines that you could choose from for type 2 diabetes. And he would typically prescribe up to five of them for patients. So the first question that I had was, can we even solve this problem? Is it is it harder or, or less hard than the Disney problem? So it turns out that the problem of choosing five medications from 60, there's only 6 million different combinations of that. <laughs> 
Oh, so piece we're, of cake. we're yeah. So we're used to. I mean, again, we're used to handling you know fifty one million billion combinations. Six million uh, is is much smaller. So from from a computational perspective, looking at it as a computer scientist, it was actually fairly easy. It was it was a lot easier to solve for this. We took some of the code that we had written for the Disney problem and adapted it. I think in a couple of weekends, right, Brad? This was this was our Sunday project for a couple of months. The thing that we would do, yeah. you know, over football games. <laughs> We, we had the core of the whole system was done in about two weeks. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then, and then we had to, uh, we had to refine it. So, uh, getting, you know, much more granular data around every individual drug, the side effects, the A1C reduction, how they work in combinations. That took a while because again, with six million combinations of drugs, you might have papers published on what, 300, 400 of them. So there were a lot of instances where we would be suggesting combinations of drugs that hadn't been formally studied before. So we had to approximate what the effect would be on, uh, you know, hemoglobin A1C or that. So Brad came up with a really elegant, I think, formula for doing that. The big problem we had, though, and the thing that we, we had to face early on was, was this. We know from Brad's experience that patients don't take medications that they can't afford. Mm -hmm. So we needed a way of allowing the patients to say, I can only spend X dollars per month on the drugs. And in order to process that, we had to get details about what drugs their insurance plans cover. And we didn't have a good source for that. But I literally called or sent an email to these guys at veracred.com. They're, uh, they're insurance data brokers. They have a database of more than 40,000 individual insurance plans in the United States, along with how much each drug costs under those plans. So we said, hey, you know, do you, do you guys have an API, a way that we could call this your database or use your database from our app. And their CEO actually called me back, which was kind of great. Mike Levin, CEO of uh, Veracred, called me back and we explained what we were doing. And he's, he said, sure, you know, we'll, we'll give you access to the API. And they actually did it for free, which was really nice. I think we're the sort of one of the poster kids for, uh, for, for what Veracred does, actually. Huh. Okay. So from my perspective, and Brad, maybe you can answer this. My radar goes up. I hear insurance data, give it away for free. You know, why would a company do that, Brad? Does this help them in some way? I mean, Veracred is not the insurance company. I get that. But were they just curious? Is this like a programming thing that these guys help each other or is there something going on? Well, I think what Veracred wants to show is that there's value in people um, having some transparency with regard to their healthcare costs. Mm -hmm. And if, if you talk to them about what their mission is, is that they want to make I think the, the environment as a whole is transparent as possible. And I think that's a, that's a big problem with regard to drug costs and understanding um, the conversation in terms of not only what the insurance company is paying for the medicine, which is where a lot of the conversation that we have now revolves around. It's important to know what the patients are paying actually at the level of the pharmacy. And there's not a lot of conversations um, in the media or on the whole about the patient's individual cost as much as the the wholesale cost, which can be sometimes extremely different from what the patient ends up paying. Yeah, definitely. And so so the, your information then based in glucose path is based on what the patient can pay. We actually have both. Yes. Oh, um, okay. Well, so we, we if, you, if you're running it in a patient scenario, yeah, it's based on what the patient says. Um, we have a population health tool that we've built that takes into account the system cost as well. So if you're a, if you pay for health insurance and you can tell us what your side of the, the cost is, we can optimize for that as well. Hmm. Okay. All right. So then what do you do with all of this? I mean, um, have you, have you tested it out? Does it really, um, have you have given it to real people? The first thing we did uh, was uh, run, we got some anonymized data from, Brad's Hospital, St. Elizabeth's in, uh, Healthcare in, in uh, Covington, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And they give us uh, data, anonymized data from 200 patients. And we ran it through the system to see what it would uh, recommend. Uh, and what we did is we compared what the patient's primary care physician had prescribed during the last visit and then compared that with what PATH would have recommended. We took that to um, a conference, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, the ACE conference in 2016. It was in Orlando, so, uh, you know, home for me. And we won their poster competition, which was uh, super interesting. I think that gave us a, a real big confidence boost, be, you know, going through, um, you know, the review of the people that were there, uh, answering lots of questions over a couple of days at the poster. I think winning winning that poster competition was a, was a big boost. In fact, Brad, I think you went back and, and told St. Elizabeth's 
that we won the poster competition. That's how we got the clinical trial, right? Yes. Yeah. So we um, we wanted to move forward and see how it actually performed in a real world setting. And so we presented the data that we had on the simulation. And it looked very compelling that we could get better outcomes for our patients, not only in terms of cost, but also in terms of the hemoglobin A1C reduction and their side effects. And so we were able to move forward with a, a real world trial um, that we're currently doing. So Brett, as, a, as an endo who is looking at this stuff, has that changed how you prescribe medication or, or treatment or, you know, because with, with type two, there are many, it seems there are many more options. You know, some people don't need medication. Some people do. Some people need oral. Some people need insulin injected. Did you kind of say, all right, I would say this, but let's see what glucose path says. Yes, absolutely. At the beginning, we were really trying to to match what I regarded as a good decision with mm-hmm. rules that the the program ran. Um, and so we would we would take a scenario, we would look what I prescribed, we would see what um, the algorithm generated, and we tweaked for a while to to get the values there. The interesting thing that started to happen though is that the algorithm started to recommend things that when I looked at it was actually a better decision than I would have made. Um, but I wouldn't have necessarily considered it because I had gotten into habitual prescribing or I hadn't realized that something had showed up on a new formulary, things like that. Now I would say the app is letting me um, understand trends that occur um, because of things like insurance negotiations or we sometimes will model medicines before they enter the market. So we get a sense of where they will be useful. So I, I found that really interesting as well. It, it, may I get specific, and you certainly don't have to answer this, but w- was this timely enough to model medications like, I'm thinking of, you know, Traceba or some of the newer, um, I would call them a basal insulin or even the um, the newer, gosh, I don't know what they're called, help me out here, where it's not insulin, but it, it's for people with type 2 to kind of simulate. Like the GLP-1 agonist? Yeah. yeah. Yes, absolutely. So um, it, we, we add the medicines as soon as they become available. Um, I've always been interested in um, the pharma pipeline. So traditionally, I was following the medicines as they went through the FDA process. We do clinical trials through my office, so I, I have a little bit of a preview there. So entering things in like Traceba is something that we're able to do. Traceba is an interesting one because we have it modeled right now based on some of the data is generating less hypoglycemia, but the, the total cost of drug is higher. With the coupon, it offsets it, and it gets prescribed a fair amount in a commercial setting. What we found was interesting is in Medicare scenarios where the patients are responsible for more of a, the total cost of drug, it depends on how much they're spending on other, other medicines. Mm. If they're already spending a lot on other medicines, then the Traceva gets prescribed because of this idiosyncrasy of Medicare that you get through something called the donut hole. I don't know if you're familiar mm-hmm. with that, but Medicare stops covering about halfway through the year in in some scenarios, but then picks back up at a catastrophic level. And so cost becomes a lot less relevant if you are already going to be spending through the donut hole. And there, um, the software will recognize that and actually pick medicines for benefit like hypoglycemia. So that was one area in particular where my my prescribing changed. That is interesting because uh, cost is the one thing that can be so challenging for so many people, especially, and then when you're talking with Medicare, it's pretty sophisticated stuff that Glucose Path is looking at that. Did you find that, uh, as you say, it gave different scenarios than you may have prescribed when the cost was put into consideration? Was that something that changed a lot from what you might have prescribed? Yeah, absolutely. Cost has always been at the core of the, the software. And I think when you're assuming certain things about the cost, that's where you make mistakes. Mm. Um, so we, we make some assumptions about um, what things cost and, and what the impact is going to be. With, with Medicare, um, it, a lot of us get, I think, bogged down by the fact that it's very difficult to avoid the coverage gap, the, the donut hole. And so in the process of trying to avoid the donut hole, we withhold beneficial medicines from our patients when really at a certain point it doesn't make a difference cost-wise. It, it might make a difference of... $20 over the course of the year, but we can actually get really beneficial medicines to our patients if we understand that the cost differential isn't nearly as large as, as we think. And Len, you have a story about this. I do. So, uh, so Brad and I were at, uh, were at uh, ADA, the ADA conference this year. And it's a, this is an interesting story about the, not only cost, but the perception of cost in the industry. So pharma has always been 
a huge supporter of PATH and what it's trying to do, which is kind of counterintuitive, you would think. But the people that we've spoken to in pharma always support the, the general mission of better healthcare. And I think that's, for me, that's actually a, a really great thing to say. Anyway, so we were at ADA and we were presenting our paper uh, and it was on the effective coupons in system costs. And, and basically what the summary was, was if you let patients use coupons, it lowers the patient cost by $40 per month for the drugs, but it raises the system cost of the drugs $175 per month. And we were pointing out some, not only some issues with that, but also how coupons change the class of medications that get picked hmm. in PATH. And there was a, a senior executive there from one of the pharma manufacturers, and he was, I would say, vigorously debating with Brad, asking why his drug wasn't getting picked more often. And the, the particular drug was was under $30 per month in cost, somewhere between $20 and $30. And, and the executive was saying, look, $25 is absolutely nothing in terms of cost. Why is your algorithm not picking it more? And, and Brad was pointing out that $25 is, is a lot of money to a lot of people. And the executive just wasn't accepting that, that argument. So we went back and, and looked in the database. And the question we acted, asked the database was this. When people tell us how much they have per month to spend on drugs, what's that average? Because in other words, people who are using glucose path, the patients that we're seeing, hmm. how much of a budget do they have every month for their medication? Do you want to take a guess on this, Stacey? I, I can't even imagine because, you know, don't forget people who have type one and need insulin, we're just paying and paying and paying. But oh. I'm going to say just from the setup, I'm going to say they said $50. <laughs> Actually, you're way closer than, than the pharma executive. That's because so you average, set it up. I wouldn't have known. The, the average patient had like uh, was spending like thirty seven fifty a month was their budget. So we actually followed up with the executive. And we said, look, you know, the reason why it's not suggesting your twenty five dollar drug is because these people have on average thirty seven fifty a month to spend. And we're not going to spend twenty five of that thirty seven dollars on one drug. It just doesn't, financially it doesn't make sense. And we actually ended up having a great conversation, not only with that executive, but with his entire team about how PATH worked after it. And they explained sort of their, their drug pricing. So it was, I think everyone learned a lot that day from that, uh, from that conversation. But that's sort of the thing that, uh, that PATH does. It's basically answering these questions, right? Is what's this you know, incremental one-tenth of a point of A1C reduction worth to you in terms of dollars in side effects? It is amazing, though, to think the, the difference in cost. If you guys, I know it's oh. not in the plans, but I mean, wait, well, I'm talking about type one because insulin is so expensive right now. I wish it was like $50 a month. The, the other thing that amazed us, and so we, I think we can say this without disclosing any uh, trade secrets, the amount of money that payers pay. So like if you're a company and you're buying health insurance, the amount of money that you pay for a drug varies so incredibly oh, yeah. widely that I'm, that was actually the most surprising thing. And then also um, like some states, that pay for Medicaid have uh, shared their Medicaid data costs with us, uh, and those vary widely as well. So, um, so that's been sort of like the big surprise to us that a drug, you know, in in one state, the the actual cost to a payer for a drug could be six hundred dollars, and in another state, it could be negative twenty. Right? They could actually get a rebate on it. The nicest thing we can say about the healthcare system is that it's complicated. So, you know, that's what we hear a lot of. Len, how, how can we use this? Is Glucose Path out there yet? Is it going to be an app? Where, where do you stand? We submitted our 510K to the FDA. Are you familiar with 510Ks? No. It's, uh, it's basically the big batch of paperwork that you submit to the FDA uh, about your medical device. We're, we, were, we thought we were considered a medical, medical device. Um, we submitted our 510K to the FDA in April. In August, they got back to us and said that we were covered under the new 21st Century Cures Act, yes. which was just signed into law last December. So we're considered um, clinical decision support software and not a medical device under the Cures Act. We're actually one of the first groups to ever get through that process, we think, under the Cures Act. So that was that was kind of phenomenal. So we're, uh, we're, we're clear to market it now. Um, it is targeted to physicians and healthcare systems because it deals with prescription data. So if you're a physician or your healthcare system and you want to use it, uh, send me an email. Or we'll get you access to it, you know, len at glucosepath.com. Yeah, you can use it. We've uh, we finished the first year of our clinical trial in uh, the beginning of October, uh, and we're working with a couple of other systems on new projects that are going to be starting up in the next few weeks. Is a goal to get it into patients' hands, or is that something that may not happen? In other words, if I want to use it, do I go to my doctor and ask? How, you know, how can an individual get access? For now, I yeah, for now, we would go, uh, I would suggest you go to your doctor and ask ask them to look at glucose path and see what it would say. We we haven't had the discussion with the FDA about making a consumer-facing 
version of it. Although I think the the tagline, ask your doctor if glucose path is right for you, I think is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does have a certain ring to it, Stacey. <laughs> it might, might not be bad. But, um, but yeah, but if you, you know, if you're interested, you know, go to your doctor. We'll, we'll get your doctor access to it. You can run your data through the, uh, through the app and see what it suggests. I will say this, the, uh, the one interesting thing in the app that you don't see in professional guidelines is this. If you go through professional guidelines like, like the ADA, uh, treatment algorithm or the ACE treatment algorithm, there's no easy way to reconsider your original decision. Hmm. So there's, there's this thing that we're calling status quo bias. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Um, if you're in step two of the, uh, the ACE algorithm where you've tried an initial drug and then added another drug to it and that's not working, the only thing that the, uh, the ACE algorithm recommends is, uh, is to start or intensify insulin. And there's no, there's nothing in the flowchart that says, you know what, you should really maybe rethink everything that you've done to this point. Yeah. Uh, so the ACE algorithm, uh, the ACE algorithm doesn't have that start over, but PATH does. So PATH will actually reconsider everything from scratch using, uh, using all of its principles. And that's kind of interesting. You get, uh, you get vastly different uh, outcomes sometimes. Absolutely. And Brad, let, what I wanted to ask you, and, and Len kind of started to answer it there, is how do you hope this will change things? for people. I mean, type two diabetes, there are so many people with it. There are many medications. You know, what do you hope happens here? So what we want is, um, well, number one, that the algorithm is a lot more aggressive than what we're seeing um, is happening in a lot of community settings. So we we're really hoping to get more than just half of the population of people with type two to goal, which is about where we are right now. I think the other thing that we're hoping for is that we're able to approach this in a cost-effective way, so it's something that's scalable. Um, If you look at the numbers right now, we're talking about over 30 million people with type 2 diabetes now with numbers growing all the time. So being able to get the right medicines to the right people at the right cost, I think, is the only way that we're going to be able to handle this as a country, and I think we, we really hope that we're part of that solution. One thing I should have asked up front, I, I realized I, I didn't, I may, you may have answered it already, though, and, uh, is does glucose path take into account medications that are not for diabetes? Because a lot of people take cholesterol and you know blood pressure along with it. Do they take those into account in terms of interaction? So right now we're just doing medicines that lower blood glucose. You are one of essentially every person that we talk to that asks that question. <laughs> um, we, we definitely plan on doing that. Right now, with regard to, to most of those medicines, there are not a lot of drug interactions between antihyperglycemics um, and cholesterol medicines, mild interactions with some of the blood pressure medicines. Blood pressure is probably going to be the next area that we approach, and we're talking to some uh, people that are experts in that area to help us build that part. We did an interim analysis of an ongoing clinical trial that we're doing at my system, which is about a 300 physician group. And so far, um, we have a little bit over um, 60 people enrolled and our three month results are showing that overall, including people that don't follow their regimen, we're lowering by about 0.8 hemoglobin A1C points over three months. If you look at the people that are following the recommendations, um, we're lowering by about 1.2. So wow. The software is essentially adding the equivalent of a entirely new type 2 diabetes medication. So we're, we're pretty happy with that. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, that's yeah. pretty significant. And those were, uh, those were patients that were already under physician control. So the, uh, the additional A1C reductions coming from changing the recommendations through software. That, I think that's kind of impressive. Yeah, that really is. I mean, a half a point, I mean, almost half a point is quite a bit. Yeah, so we're 0.8 and 1.2. That's pretty good. All right, so we will link up all the information about Glucose Path and how to get there and how to find out and ask your doctor about Glucose Path. <laughs> Does it crack you up? <laughs> it does. It's just, it's so funny. <laughs> and you don't have to have a whole page of disclaimers, right? This may cause, blah, 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 you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Call your physician if you can't get off your phone for more than two hours. All right, so, Brad, stand by again. Len, I got a couple more Disney questions for you. Sure. As people are preparing for the busy, busy holiday season, can you give us a couple of quick tips or at least, you know, mistakes that you see people make? Obviously, we're going to send them to touringplants.com. Thank you. But of course, and I use it myself, but what are the top things that you recommend? Two things. One, have a little bit of a plan to figure out what you want to see uh, and what you should see first thing in the morning. Generally, um, if you're going to a park, know which attractions get crowded first thing and either try and get fast pass plus reservations for them 
or see them first thing. So in the Magic Kingdom, the ride that is in demand is Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. If that's on your list, if you've got you know children that are old enough to ride it, you definitely want to do that first or get fast passes for it. Over in Animal Kingdom, it's Flight of Passage, which uh, is the James Cameron Avatar film based ride that just opened in May. It's actually, uh, Stacey, I don't know if you know this, it's, it's the highest rated ride in any Disney or Universal theme park in the United States. Really? Uh, yeah, it just came out. Yeah, extremely popular and a very good ride. Fast passes are very hard to come by. Uh, if you can't get fast passes, go first thing in the morning. That's when the lines are going to be uh, lowest. I would suggest, if you want to see that, showing up at the Animal Kingdom Park 45 minutes to an hour before it opens and just get in the line for that. Totally worth it. Yeah, so the, and then the other thing, too, is uh, uh, is arrive early. The uh, the crowds in the parks generally don't peak until sometime between noon and 3. So if you get there at 8 or 9 when the park opens, you'll have uh, much fewer, uh, many fewer people to, uh, to compete with for rides, and you'll get a lot more done. Overhyped ride. What is the attraction at Disney World that you just shake your head? Overhyped? Oh, my God, this is a great question. Um <laughs> You know, I, I don't think Test Track is that great of a ride, uh, especially the – so this is in Epcot. This is the Chevrolet-sponsored ride that purportedly takes you through the ride testing process. It's exactly the same as the old ride with a new sort of Tron film overlay. It does absolutely nothing for me. also breaks down a lot. I don't know that that's a, a great endorsement <laughs> of General Motors vehicles, uh, <laughs> frankly. So, you know, I can I can do without it. When we talk about Disney or vacations here, I get a lot of questions about type one, about having uh, conditions that may be considered as disabilities or special access. Do you have any information on that or and not specifically to type one, but do you discuss that? I don't recall seeing a lot of that in touring plans. Yeah. So if you've got a condition that affects your ability to wait in line, for example, or uh, you know, mobility issue or sort of a sensory overload thing, Disney has this thing called the Disability Access Service, the DAS service. And uh, here's how it works. You go up to guest relations the first day that you're going to visit a park. You explain to them that you, uh, you're you not able to wait in line or you're not able to be in a situation with uh, close-in crowds or large noise or whatever. And they will give you a pass that acts like a fast pass reservation for any ride that accepts fast pass. And that allows you to bypass standing in lines, uh, for example, in those rides. So again, if you've got somebody with autism, for example, who can't be in close quarters for 45 minutes or an hour, this allows you to bypass the line, to use the fast pass line, and to see the ride. And that uh, generally avoids a lot of the anxiety that people feel about, about waiting in line. Disney doesn't, and they can't, uh, ask you what your specific condition is. They don't require a doctor's note. You do need the ability to explain the effects of your condition. So, I, again, I can't, I can't wait in line. My child can't wait in line. My child can't experience loud noises, you know, things like that. Right. Um, but, you, yeah, but use the DAS system to get around. Also, there are uh, any number of audio and visual aids for people with uh, with those issues. So if you uh, if you want closed captioning or uh, boosted audio assistance, they've got all those things as well. Brad, what advice? You've got to talk to Disney uh, with Len. What, what advice has he given you or that you've gleaned that you could pass on? I think knowing that the timing in the morning is particularly helpful because it's not just getting there when the park opens, but uh, there's actual, like for Flight of Passage, for example, it's not only getting there when it opens, but before it opens. And there's actually particular spots that you have to stand in order to beat the crowd as the crowd surges towards the ride. So he has That's a whole true. team of people that um, look at like that individual rush. And so I'm actually going this weekend. And so I, I'm, I'm try I've not rode Flight of Passage yet. So I'm mentally uh, trying to develop a strategy there. Very nice. Very nice. Leonard, are, are you and your sister still big Disney fans? Is the, is the magic? Is it still there? In fact, we, uh, we were there this last weekend. My mom uh, is celebrating her 75th birthday this month, and she wanted the family to go to <laughs> Disney World. So we had 12 people traipsing around the parks. Ah, oh, Stacey, it was, it was like 92 degrees, too. It's humid. Oh, my God. It was, uh, it was like, this is the worst family reunion ever, but it's the best place for it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you still have fun there, or is it work? You know, it's it's always you're always evaluating stuff, but no, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I um I got to go with my four year old niece uh, uh, on a couple of rides. That's always fun. We took uh, so our daughter uh, Hannah was out of school, and she's a huge fan of uh, Casey's Corner, the hot dog place yeah. on Main Street. So you know, we bought <laughs> hot dogs for everyone, and the amount of food this small nineteen year old girl can eat is is astounding. Like I'm thinking I need to enter her in, a, in an eating competition of some. <laughs> 
but uh, you know, but that was fun. And then you know, we uh, we did Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party one night, and we danced with you know the characters and stuff. And that's you know, those are memories. And so it's still fun. That's great. Well, guys, I really appreciate it. Glucose Path sounds really interesting. We'll put the information out there. But thanks for spending some time with me and my listeners to explain this. And I hope you keep us posted. We'll check back in. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. More information about Len and Glucose Path and Brad and their partnership, all at diabetes-connections.com or in the show notes. To me, the most hopeful or breakthrough part of Glucose Path is when you heard from Brad, the endocrinologist, who spoke about how it found medications and made recommendations that he didn't see, right? Because we all get into these habits and patterns And I thought it was great of him to talk about it that way. I'm really interested to follow this more and to learn more about how it's used and and really when patients get their hands on it, how it goes, how we use it, how we change it. So I will definitely keep you posted on that. And yeah, I have to say, we're going to Disney World in just a couple of weeks. And my husband is such a good sport. He really is not into it, but he tolerates me. And he goes along with the plan because, of course, I I don't use, as I said much earlier, I I don't go to the minute with lens plans, but they're so useful and you really, really can use them in, in terrific ways to plan a fun time. And we never wait in line. Last time we went to Disney World four or five years ago, I don't think we waited in line for anything for longer than 15 minutes. So highly recommend, and uh, I will link it all up. All right, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about 11 years with type 1 diabetes, which it sounds wild to me that it's been that long, but at the same time, I'm almost surprised it's not even longer. You know, if you're a parent of older kids, you know, teens or even 20s, it's almost hard to imagine your life before children. You know, I, I I had a life before children. I did stuff. I know. I remember it. But it seems so long ago. And my oldest is only 16. It wasn't that long ago, but it might as well be. And I kind of feel that way about diabetes. It's just been here forever. So Benny's doing great. He We don't talk about him a lot on this show. It's not that kind of show where I'm going to say, we did it this way, so you should do it that way. He likes to keep things more personal than that. And I'm not a medical professional, so I'm, I'm definitely not here to give you advice. But I will say, I'm really proud of him. His attitude has always been good. I don't know if you can teach that. He just is a happy kid and he's, he's forgetful. You know, he can be irresponsible. He's a normal, almost 13 year old, but he does, as he said to me, he really summed it up well once. He said to me, mom, I don't worry about diabetes, but I care about it. And I hope that helps you worry less. And I thought, I will never worry less, but it resonated with me because a child shouldn't be worrying about himself. He should care about himself, but it's my job as a mom to be the warrior. So I felt really good in a way when he said that. That was pretty cool. And that was just this year. So let me share a story about Benny when he was very little. I wrote about this uh, a long time ago. I I did have a blog at stacysims.com and I I still contribute to that every now and then. So if you want to read our story right from the beginning, I'll link that up and you can see there's a lot of radio stuff on it as well. It's not all diabetes, but this is from um, May of 2009. And I'm talking here about changing Benny's inset. Uh, I don't know about you, but when he was little, This was the worst. This was always the weak link in our diabetes care. To be honest with you, sometimes it still is because, you know, the cannulas can kink and things can go wrong. It's much easier than it used to be. But Benny was terrified of it. He really was always scared of it, even as he got used to shots and finger sticks very early on. So, you know, we used to use lidocaine. But we didn't use it at first. You have to leave that on for an hour. And it seemed like a lot to do. But... And Benny hated the button. We always called the, the inset the button. I have no idea why. But after it was on him, it didn't hurt at all. We, and we kind of thought he would get used to that, right? Just pop it on. But he didn't. Uh, so we basically had to hold him very tight and pop the button on for the first year. And that's not too hard with a two-year-old. But as he got bigger, it got tougher. And it was heartbreaking. You know, I, I spent the next six months trying to convince him the cream wouldn't hurt. He would not even let me put it on his skin. And finally, when he did, it really did make a difference for us. But he never liked to to change the button. You know, he always, one more story, one more show. He always stall. 
So here it is in 2009, as I'm telling the story on the blog, um, and we're doing all sorts of silly things to make it easier and to distract him. So his favorite right now is having Slade hold him upside down, my husband Slade, while I pop the button on. Recently, though, Slade wasn't around and it was button day. I reminded Benny that upside down button placement is not a one person job. So he said, let's have Elmo do it. Now, Benny's always loved his stuffed animals, and when we first got his pump, his Mickey Mouse doll wore one, too. As an aside here, everybody had a pump. Bob the Builder on TV, right? Why else did he have a belt? He obviously had a pump. So anytime he saw somebody on TV, he just, that's, you know, he's got a pump. He's got diabetes. So Elmo was his favorite at the time that I was writing this, and uh, he's been helping us with diabetes for a while, I wrote. You see, Sometimes Elmo has diabetes too, and Benny has to check Elmo's blood sugar. He gets a pretend juice box if he's low, insulin if he's high. Benny will put a button on him and talk to him about diabetes. It really is great. I wasn't sure how we were going to have Elmo help us out here, but I was willing to try. And as usual, my kids showed me the way. Leah, my daughter, came in to see what was going on, and she decided we would play Elmo Says. She held Elmo and had him tell us what to do. Put your hand on your head, hop on one foot, let mommy put your button on. And it worked. Yay for Elmo and for Leah. The only time Benny complains about having diabetes is when we change his inset. I think he's a pretty cool customer with all the finger pricks and glucose checks, especially for a four-year-old. But if we can get this butt thing a little less stressful for him, I think it'll be so much better in the long run. We may feel a little silly playing Elmo Says every three days, but if it works, bring on the silly. And I wrote that in 2009. Um, he was four. Leah was seven. And I had forgotten all about that until I reread it uh, a couple of days ago. The kids are really pretty amazing. And playing with the stuffed animals and, and pretending they had diabetes and talking to them about what he was going through was so huge for both of my kids, really. I highly encourage that. If you've got a kid recently diagnosed or a sibling, you know, who, who's trying to figure out what's going on, let them play. Let them work it out that way. It's so great for kids. And I'm happy to report that now at age almost 13, I do not remember the last time I did an inset on Benny. He does it all himself. Camp helped a lot with that. Probably not wanting to have your mother touch you helped a lot with that. Although he'll still hug me, but you know, he doesn't want to lift up his shirt and have me do all that stuff. <laughs> but it is amazing how much things have changed. He still hates it. It's you know, the kind of thing I can only imagine having to stick yourself with an inset every three days, but he does a great job. And thankfully, we do not have to hold him upside down anymore because that would definitely be a circus act. Although it's really pretty much a circus around here every day anyway. All right, lots of great stuff still to come before we wrap it up for the year. I cannot believe that. Next week, we will be talking about Noah's March. Way back in January, I talked to this kid Noah who said, I'm going to walk across the United States. And his parents said, let's do it. And they're doing it. They're almost finished. In fact, by the time you listen to this show... They may have already done it. So we are going to be wrapping things up with Noah next week about Noah's March and finding out more about what motivated them. What did they learn along the way? And we'll be talking to the other end of the spectrum, a gentleman who has lived with type one for many decades, wants to help make it easier for kids, but really shares a lot of what's changed. And he even sent me some pictures of some of the old gear. I'm always fascinated by that. It's really incredible how uh, some things have changed. That's next week. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Diabetes Connections on whatever podcast app you are listening. We do have our very own app, and that is a great way to stay connected. It's the app for uh, Android or for Apple. It's just Diabetes Connections, easy to download. And if you're not already there, join the Facebook group. That is growing every day. We just started it. Lots of fun. Get to know other listeners. And it's uh, international. There's people from all over the world there already. It's Diabetes Connections, the group on Facebook. As always, thank you to my editor, to John Buchanis of Audio Editing Solutions. And to you, as you listen, it is a privilege to spend an hour every week with people like you who just get it. I'm Stacey Sims, and I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.